In this video, we're going to discuss a few of the basic principles of the operation of an NMR spectrometer. So we have this type of setup here. We have some type of device which will generate a specific frequency of radiation. We have a sample here which is going to absorb or not absorb a certain amount of that radiation. And then we have a detector here which is going to detect how much of that radiation at that specific frequency has or hasn't been absorbed by the sample and then port that to an output which can be monitored. And we have our magnet here which has uh, some generating end at a south pole, some generating end with a north pole, and then in between it's generating a man magnetic field uh, in which the sample is is in its presence. So let's first define the resonance frequency. So we assume we're interested in a specific nucleus inside of a certain molecule inside this sample here. So this resonance frequency is the frequency at which our energy transition occurs between the spin up and the spin down states of our of our nuclear spin of whatever pro proton of interest in the sample is. Or if it's a different nucleus, the spin up and spin down states of that nucleus of any specific one half one half spin nucleus that we're talking about. Okay, and we've seen from the previous video also that the frequency at which this transition occurs is directly proportional to the magnetic field in which the sample is placed. So a larger magnetic field will mean a larger separation between the energy levels and a larger frequency of radiation which is necessary to induce that transition between energy levels. So there's a couple options we have here with respect to generating this uh, kind of magnetic resonance, this frequency at which this jumping between the spin up and spin down state occurs. We can either fix the frequency of radiation that's generated and then vary the strength of the magnetic field in order to observe where the resonance frequency is. Or alternatively, we can fix the strength of the magnetic field and then we can vary the frequency of radiation which is being generated and measured th through the sample. And both of these techniques in, eff in effect because of this proportionality will end up generating the same spectrum if graphed in the correct way. Okay, so what we'll have here is if we graph this, I'll have a graph here where up on the axis up here we have signal strength, which is just a relative value and, and unitless. And then on our axis down here, we have increasing to the right, we have the magnetic field and or the frequency, whichever you choose the graph. So we'll have a point we'll have points where there is very low signal, very low signal, very low signal, and then all of a sudden very high response at our resonance frequency if we only have a single type of that nucleus present in the sample. So this particular point here on our graph would be our resonance frequency often what we're going to call new knot. So in order to, for us to have this new knot, we usually need a reference signal. We need some type of reference nucleus. And there aren't a lot of, you know, just bare, pro, bare protons or bare hydrogen nuclei just floating around in solution. They're usually, they're usually bonded to something. So for reasons which we will discuss in later videos, um, the usual reference signal when you're doing H1 NMR spectroscopy so just a bare pro just a proton by itself the the molecule which you use to generate this signal this reference signal is tetramethylsilane so tetramethylsilane also called TMS and this is a silicon atom which is centrally bonded to four methyl groups 
So silicon is just below carbon in the periodic table, so it wants to covalently bond to four different atoms. It's covalently bonded to four carbons, each of which is a methyl group having three protons. And there are lots of good properties um, which make this a good um, choice for a reference signal, a lot of which we'll be able to pr appreciate more in later videos. But some of these properties which makes uh, TMS a good choice for a reference signal in H1 NMR spectroscopy is that it is non-reactive. So whatever sample you have, um, it's probably not going to react with TMS. TMS is very stable and not going to affect whatever is occurring in your sample vessel. There are 12 protons here, so it's going to generate a strong signal. As we'll see, signal strength is proportional to the number of chemically equivalent protons. So having 12 protons, which are chemically equivalent, gives you a very strong reference signal like that. And what we're going to discuss in later videos is that it is highly shielded. So it's going to be, it's going to absorb uh, at a at a much different frequency than most of the other types of typical organic protons that you're going to see and thus you have it separated and differentiated from the rest of the spectrum. It's not going to mess us up and be right in the middle of the rest of the spectrum that we're trying to figure out. And as we said, so we can either change this uh, new or we can change the B. A lot of what determines um, the strength of an NMR spectrometer is going to be um, the frequency at which it operates and there are there are a number of common frequencies at which NMR spectrometers operate and higher frequency means a more powerful machine and that's usually a bigger machine which will get you more more accurate more highly resolved spectra so some common uh, frequencies here in terms of megahertz 60 megahertz, 90, 250, and then all of the kind of hundreds up the line, 300, 400, 500. Some of the very most powerful ones, 700 megahertz is strong enough to do uh, what's called 3D NMR, and you can actually resolve the entire structure of a protein if you kind of do an overnight experiment inside of a 700 megahertz NMR. And then some of the largest ones out on the market today would be 1,000 1, megahertz or 1 gigahertz NMR spectrometers.